Buenos días a todos y a todas. Eh, buenas tardes para algunos. Buenas Good morning, días. everyone. Good afternoon, some others. This is our session within the Pan American Climate Resilient Health Systems course. We are truly happy to be uh, to have you here today. So let's now begin the session on evaluating risks on human health and health systems because of climate change. I am Hilma Mantisha, I will be chairing or leading this meeting. We have amazing speakers today, as you will see in a minute. Uh, remember that this course has interpretation into Spanish, English and French. Right now we have a live interpretation. So anyone can, you know, click on the bottom at the bottom of your screen uh, and select the language of their choice so that they can uh, better follow this presentation. Remember that this is a nine session course that takes place every Tuesday and Thursday. This is the second session of the course and it has to do with assessing uh, risks on uh, related to climate change, human health and health systems. Just a few things so that we're all on the same page. Please check that every microphone is muted. Also, don't worry about uh, attendance because the system knows if you are participating or not. Uh, you, you don't need to do anything else. Please keep your cameras on during the session. You know that it's important uh, to, you know, although we're here virtually, it's very important to see each other. Uh, regarding logistics, as I have said from session one, this will be a 90 minute session. The session um, allows you to ask questions. At the bottom of your screen, there is an icon reading Q&A, that is a Q&A section. So hopefully we'll have the chance to answer some of your questions, the panelists will. If it's too many questions and we don't manage to answer them all, they will they will be answered by email. Every session will be recorded and, and they will be posted um, online on the course website. And you will also have on the website the slides presented here. Which are the learning objectives of today's session? First of all, we will be working on uh, vulnerability and adaptation to climate change. This is basic for the resilience of health systems. We'll be describing these concepts. They are essential in order to analyze, to conduct assessment of vulnerability, uh, vulnerability and risk assessment. And the idea is to help you uh, implement different methods in order to take action in hospitals uh, in the area of climate change and also to help modify policies, programs and plans in order to reduce or mitigate the severity of risks entailed by climate change. Our speakers, as I was saying, we have the pleasure, you know, to have these presenters. We have Chris Ibai, she's professor at the University of Washington Center for Health and the Global Environment. She has focused on understanding the uh, vulnerability and adaptation processes in different contexts. She has assessed several countries in Central America, Europe and Africa, and she has also participated in the uh, IPCC report. She has been um, advising several governments in this process of um, working with uh, a vulnerability and adaptation. So first we'll have Chris, then we'll have Mercy Barbara Cordoba. She's an oceanographer. She has a PhD in environmental sciences and she has been 
working in the interface between climate, environment, and health. As uh, you see, she will be talking about this uh, interdisciplinary process, and she, which she really addresses in her research. Then we'll have Anaim Membrive, she's a geographer. She uh, is a consultant for PAHO and WHO. She works in a specific project uh, implemented in Neuquena, province of Argentina. She will be telling us about the process implemented to uh, uh, to put into practice a, a specific prevention plan in Argentina. And finally, we'll have Matt. He manages the San Francisco Department of Public Health's Climate and Health Program. He will be telling about telling us about their experience regarding uh, climate, uh, local health impacts of climate change in San Francisco and how they have dealt with vulnerability and adaptation processes. Without further ado, as I have said, we have an amazing group of panelists and we will be interacting with them. So without further ado, I would like to give Chris the floor so that she can begin the presentation. Chris, welcome and thank you so much again for being part of this course. Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of the course and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the participants who are joining from around the world. As you can see, I'll be talking about assessing risks through conducting vulnerability and adaptation assessments. I have a few key messages I'll put up front so that everyone can understand at the beginning what the focus of the presentation is. You've already had one session, you're going to have other sessions in this course, and you know it's very important to understand the, the wide range of health risks and vulnerabilities that are shifting as our climate continues to change. Conducting a vulnerability and adaptation assessment is a key method for communities and countries to prepare for and respond to those risks. Vulnerability and adaptation assessments are being conducted not just in the health sector, but in all sectors. And for those of you who are working at the national level, you'll find that there's colleagues working in agriculture, water, other sectors who are also conducting vulnerability and adaptation assessments. I put the six basic steps in the list here that you can see before you. I'll talk about each one briefly. You will have the slides. So you'll be able to go through these in more detail. There is a WHO report that provides extensive information about each one of these steps. As a reminder, we know that our climate is changing. And when we think about a vulnerability and adaptation assessment, it's not just looking at temperature precipitation changes, but looking at how those interact with a broad range of vulnerabilities. There is, as you know, a very long list of climate sensitive health outcomes. And the drivers of those outcomes include not just changing temperature, but also shifts in our demographic patterns, changes in our health status, geopolitical kinds of conditions. And we need to think about those when we look at a vulnerability and adaptation assessment. At the same time, we need to assess the capacity and resilience of our health systems. And that is not only the structures themselves, there's far too many healthcare facilities that are located in harm's way with respect to flooding or sea level rise, for example, but also our health workforce and to ensure that our health workforce has everything that they need to be able to address shifting patterns in disease. These interactions then affect this broad range of climate sensitive health risks. This is a graphic from the World Health Organization. There's many similar kinds of graphics 
that just emphasizes the broad remit in this area. To further discuss a little bit the points I made on the previous so slide, when we think about the future, <laughs> we think about risk, where risk is probability times consequence. Risk is in the future, and the future is inherently uncertain. The framing from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is risk is composed of three basic factors. I think four is more useful for the health sector. The first are the hazards created by a changing climate. The second are the human and natural systems exposed to those hazards. We know not everyone is equally exposed. There's places that are more at risk for flooding, places that are more at risk for drought. So we know there's different exposures in different locations. We also know there's different exposures for different groups of people. The third factor is the underlying vulnerability of those people and places. And I would separate vulnerability into susceptibility. There's groups that are more susceptible, susceptible to the exposures. We know older adults, pregnant women, outdoor workers are more susceptible to high temperatures, for example. And then also the capacity of our health systems to manage these changes. And when we think then about the vulnerability and adaptation assessment, we have to think about that susceptibility and that ability, capacity of our health systems to manage. In thinking about risk, there's lots of different graphics explaining risk management cycles. This is one that's been used for quite some time in climate change, where you'll see the different steps in risk management. They're very similar to the kinds of comments I'm gonna make about a vulnerability and adaptation assessment. The first question is why do we need to do this? Why not just react to climate change as it happens? As you've heard, there's a long time frame and a great deal of uncertainty about what kinds of changes in our weather patterns we'll see at a local scale. And because of that, it makes anticipating risks and being prepared for disease outbreaks, for example, are much more difficult. The second is the possibility for irreversible and catastrophic impacts. Heat waves are becoming more frequent and more intense. Many of you on this call have experienced very high temperatures, temperatures outside the normal range. Preparing for that takes time. It's not necessarily difficult, but it does take time. We also would miss opportunities to reduce climate change risks by being better prepared. As I've emphasized and will continue to emphasize, the context matters. We're looking not just at changes in temperature and precipitation, sea level rise, but looking at a range of other factors that will determine the effectiveness of, of adaptation strategies, policies, and measures. We have to take into account differences in culture, in language, education, knowledge, and more that I've listed a bit on this slide. And within public health, we have to address these challenges within the context of other issues, access to clean water and sanitation, an important driver for vector-borne diseases, inadequate nutrition, other diseases such as HIV AIDS. And of course, poverty is a major factor. We have to think about not only who are the most vulnerable, but why are they particularly vulnerable? I put definitions in here. It's important that we all are on the same page. And these are definitions used within the IPCC. So these are definitions common across all sectors. Where vulnerability is the capacity, apologies, vulnerability is the degree to which individuals and systems are susceptible to or unable to cope with the adverse effects of climate variability and change. And adaptation is about the process by which individuals and societies prepare for and cope with our uncertain future. I also wanted to mention something that can be confusing 
within climate change, we talk about adaptation. As I said, it's a process for designing, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating measures to reduce impacts of a change in climate. And as you look at that, you can see that adaptation is essentially the same as public health prevention. But the term chosen by the climate change community was adaptation. And within the context of the work that's done in health, this is basic public health prevention. We look at preventing the onset of disease, prevent the development of disease if someone is exposed, and then look at treatment measures if someone is suffering from the exposure. This is the cover of the World Health Organization Vulnerability and Adaptation Assessment. It was published in 2021. And on the right is a graphic showing you the six steps that I mentioned for conducting such an assessment. As I said, I will go through some of these briefly, make a few comments, and then look forward to your questions. We're doing these assessments in the context of building climate resilience in our health systems and in our healthcare facilities. So the, as I emphasized from the beginning, we need to look at both sides. We need to look at our health systems and we need to look at our healthcare facilities. Step one is getting started planning the assessment. And from my experience, the most challenging part for many ministries, for many communities, is the how actually do we get started? There's a huge range of climate sensitive health outcomes, hundreds of them. And how do you bound an assessment? And thinking through what kind of budget you have, what kind of time you have, what are the per current interests from the Ministry of Health? And then use that information to decide the questions to be asked and the time frame that you're concerned about. That some of the assessments are focused on the next couple of decades. Some will focus out to the end of the century. Some will look at just a few climate sensitive health outcomes in a few geographic regions. Others will take a broader remit. It's not that any one set of choices is right or wrong. You have to be practical on what you can do. And as I said, just look at what you are able to do in the time frame that you have in the human and financial resources that you've been allocated. From the perspective of the adaptation community, it's more important that you establish a process that will continue to be followed. These are not one-offs. Vulnerability and adaptation assessments will continue, continue to be conducted on some kind of regular basis, perhaps every five years, for the rest of your careers. Because climate's going to continue to shift, our risks are going to continue to shift, and we're going to need to continue to modify our policies and programs to make sure that our health systems and our healthcare facilities are prepared. A second important point on this slide is establishing a stakeholder process. Who are the stakeholders that you want to have engaged and have them engaged from the beginning? You can think about the ministries that are responsible for water and sanitation, if that's not in the health sector. Agriculture, for example. You also want to think about the populations that could be affected and make sure that there are trusted voices for those populations that can help inform the assessment as it moves forward. And the third is to develop a communication plan that you wanna, from the beginning, have a plan for how you're going to disseminate the information you're gonna collect, synthesize, and then present back. The first step then, once you've done all the background, you've set up your committees, you've got everything organized, is to describe the current burden of climate sensitive health outcomes. There generally are data available to do this. You want to collect the data that are available. You also want to talk with people who are responsible for the programs to manage, for example, dengue fever. There's a, a rich amount of qualitative information 
that the vulnerability and adaptation assessment really should collect. It will benefit a lot from talking with people who run these programs, who understand the vulnerable populations, the geographic regions. And so you can go through this. It's mostly quantitative, but there are lots of data that you can assess qualitatively. And as you'll hear in a bit, that's going to be very helpful as you work through the vulnerability and adaptation assessment. As I've mentioned several times, there's lots of factors that need to be considered in terms of vulnerabilities. For example, at the bottom, talking about the geographic factors, unplanned housing is a major risk for diarrheal diseases, for example. And many of the factors that are listed on the slide are outside the purview of the health sector. But data are being collected on many of these by other elements in the government. So other, other ministries are looking at demographic change. Other ministries are looking at the issues around mapping, for example, flood risk zones, coastal storm, cyclone risk zones. And so ensuring that you have the stakeholders that help you find and access that information, you don't need to collect it yourself if someone else in the government is collecting it. Just make sure that you have access to it and develop the memorandum of understanding the collaborations you need with those elements. Once you have the background information, you understand the current burden, climate sensitive health outcomes, the next step then is to really assess the capacity of our systems to be able to manage those. And this includes thinking about recent policies implemented to try and reduce the burden of vector-borne diseases, policies trying to increase access to safe water, improved sanitation, and thinking about the plans that are likely to be implemented over the time frame that you're concerned about. And so taking a look at those policies and programs and our healthcare infrastructure and assessing how effective are they now and how likely effective are the programs that are planned and what that could mean for the burden of climate sensitive health outcomes. This is a, an example. I understand the text is very small. I took it out of the WHO guidance on the different elements of a health system and the kinds of issues that you would want to look at as you're working through a vulnerability and adaptation assessment. The fourth step is then looking into the future of what could happen in a changing climate. The emphasis of the document is that there are qualitative approaches that you can take to project the health risks of climate change. Quantitative Approaches are available. The methods, the statistical methods are quite complicated. And there may not be the time or the capacity to be able to develop those quantitative projections. However, based on the information that you've collected, including the qualitative information, it's possible, for example, to have a series of meetings with people running the dengue control program and say, these are the projections that we're expecting over the next, whatever the time period is of this assessment, and say, if temperature is going to go up about one degree, what would you expect would happen in terms of the burden of dengue? And so you can think through ways to look into the uncertain future we're facing using the data you already have and talking with the experts that you have within the health sector but also talking with experts outside the sector to estimate the possible additional burden of adverse health outcomes due to climate change. You don't need to have precision on those possible additional burdens. There's lots of uncertainty with projections, but you do want to know kind of on an order of magnitude, what's gonna get a lot bigger, what's gonna get a lot worse? And where might it happen? Where might we see expansions in the geographic range of vector-borne diseases? So that you can start planning what needs to be done at the community or at the level of the Ministry of Health to take into account those changes and be better prepared. 
The adaptation assessment then does what I just started talking about. It identifies and prioritizes the various kinds of policies, programs, and actions to address current and projected health risks. All of the health risks of a changing climate are really what we're concerned about for the future, that we may see emergence of new diseases. It's more likely we're going to see shifts in the current burden of diseases or health outcomes. And so thinking about what needs to be done to prepare for those. One of the areas that's very difficult for many groups as they go through and do a VNA is the prioritization part of how do you choose priorities when there are likely to be many shifts in the burden of climate sensitive health outcomes. And this is why it's important to consider timing. It's important to consider what kinds of policies and programs are already in place and to think about what the priorities are for the Minister of Health, to think about the national priorities, the development priorities, and use those various perspectives to help set the priorities for the recommendations of action to take. I think the rest of this is relatively clear. Some of the steps here are a bit complex, can require a bit of resources, for example, estimating the cost of action and inaction. It's important to remember as you go through the WHO document, as you think about conducting vulnerability and adaptation assessments, that the guidance is flexible, that you, you don't have to do everything in the first vulnerability and adaptation assessment, that you can choose the parts that are relevant for you today, for your community, whomever you're serving today, and make sure that you set up a process that the next time around you can expand on it and note that the next time around perhaps you should do some estimation of the cost of action and inaction. And finally, you synthesize it. You want to synthesize this effort into a policy relevant document that will inform decisions being taken about how to prepare for our changing climate. As part of that synthesis, you want to establish an iterative process. As I mentioned before, these are not one-offs. These are gonna be continual assessments, probably on the order of every five years. And so you wanna set it up so that the next time this is done, the group that does it understands exactly what you did, the process that you followed, and the recommendations that you're making for what to consider in the next iteration. As I've said before, process is as important as outcome. And make sure that you have those stakeholders and policymakers engaged. Because the outcome is an expression of values. It's not a purely analytic exercise. You need to address the constraints and barriers for taking action within the context of development pathways within your countries. And overall, the experience from health and from a variety of other sectors is a risk management approach is going to be the most effective overall. One area where you may make some recommendations is identifying some indicators. This is a framework from a WHO document that came out last year on how to start developing a set of indicators to measure climate resilience of health system functions. And so if you've got questions about indicators, they'll be covered in other presentations as well, but to note that there is a WHO document that could be helpful. And with that, there is a poll for you to answer a question. So I've got a few questions that I will start answering until I'm told I'm about at time. 
And I apologize, I do not read Spanish. And so I'm um, going to have to have someone help me with some of the questions. <laughs> Cris, eh, mientras ellos terminan de contestar, eh, las preguntas las vamos Chris, a hacer. Chris, in the meantime, uh, while they'll reply to the survey, um, we are going to leave the questions to the end of the session when they have listened to all of the speakers so that we are we are clear on what the question means at the end of the session. Thank you. Okay. No sé si de pronto tú quieras hacer un comentario con relación a la respuesta. Um, do you have a comment about the how the question was answered? The poll question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> to clarify on the poll question, a vulnerability and adaptation assessment is a critical component of developing a national adaptation plan. But the national adaptation plan is a bit broader. And so there are more elements to developing a national adaptation plan. The VNA is this very critical element of it. So the answer was actually no. Bueno, parte, yo creo que el proceso de este... Well, great. Uh, I, I think... Uh, part of, of the process of this course is to make those clarifications. So um, I think the presentation was great at, at giving us that broad perspective of what a vulnerability assessment is and how to implement that process within the health sector. Thank you so much, Chris. And hopefully at the end, we will have a few minutes for questions. We already have are, are collecting many questions and we hope you can answer those at the end. So now I give the floor to Mercy so that she can share her presentation, please. Can you see my screen? Not yet, it's not showing up yet. Yes, there it is. Great. Great. Thank you. It's great for me to, to be sharing my presentation in this course. And I'm going to share the vulnerability assessment that we did in a city called Duran in the context where we started and after the excellent presentation by Dr. Chris, I wanted to uh, state that the last IPCC report stated that clearly climate change will increase the frequency and severity of extreme weather events throughout the world, but it also establishes that urban areas are going to be specifically impacted by these adverse events, and these events will affect human health, and it will also uh, especially affect marginalized and vulnerable communities. But on the other hand, something else I wanted to bring as a context is uh, about our cities in Latin America. It's important to know the way they are. They have some specific characteristics. They are managed by local communities and what we see like Dr. Chris was presenting the, the global vision and if we need to bring this down to the local level and those who make decisions in the territories. And so we need to take into account that cities and local governments have the competency in, in managing disasters at the local level and they can work on the subsystems and providing systems for healthcare services. So assessing vulnerability of urban seed systems is critical to be able to establish the climate actions that will build towards resilience. And some visions of our cities that this is very common to many cities in Latin America lack 
of public services, communities that need healthcare services. So something that I wanted to analyze about this city with a population of 300,000 that is in the delta of a river in the South Pacific. And it's a city located in lower lands and where there used to be wetlands. So it's continuously affected by floods. And we started this work in 2018 with a local alliance with the local government and working with the center in the Pacific to reduce climate risks. And we wanted to analyze the vulnerability to floods to, and to landslides and to know to learn about this great unknown that is um, heat islands. And so not just in connection with the variables that are here, topography, ecosystems, but also human variables that are also closely connected with the structure in the way the cities uh, developed the basis for those settlements. But also, we started this um, joint work. It was a really interesting co-production. And we discussed risks, threats, and vulnerabilities. And we worked in this framework, speaking of vulnerability as an interaction between exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity or lack thereof. And this is influenced by factors that we're going to discuss further. And we can also uh, use indirect information from available sources on this. We can also um, obtain information from the local stakeholders, people who live there who know the problems in their neighborhoods. As you can see here, this woman knew, um, for example, they have, the, the picture shows this makeshift adaptation measure with that small ditch. So we can look at vulnerability and we try to show in this chart that the threats that affect, in this case, a city, are multiple. So we work with this uh, multi-threat system that is shown by the Sendari framework for risk reduction that shows us that we need to look at the risks uh, comprehensively, not just one threat or the other. So we integrated some threats that have to do with the climate and others, such as the pandemic we just went through. And we can look at some of the variables like, like exposure, sensitivity, and adaptation capacity or lack thereof. And here I state I have di different levels and we can always uh, discuss different those three levels, individual vulnerability, the vulnerability of the city and the community, and also the vulnerability of institutions and infrastructures, in our case, healthcare systems. And about exposure, we always uh, discussing frequency and intensity. It can be the number of hot days, temperatures with temperatures at a certain range, or the areas that are prone to landslides, or the areas that had a number, a high number of sick people when we had the pandemic. So sensitivity has to do with the conditions in the system. And here we looked at the demographics as well, gender, age, 
whether they have previous conditions and whether they are diabetics, whether they had disabilities, previous respiratory diseases. And this is very important when looking at a city basic services because they provide water that they drink, they provide sanitation to have an environment that is healthy for young children, for the elderly, for people with previous conditions. So it's a lot more sens sensitive for people who are in places that don't that have the Finally, adaptation capacity. Here we have included topics such as education, health systems, uh, uh, private and public health systems, and also uh, the groups of professionals that work with nutrition, diabetic patients, etc. That's also a very interesting topic, information. How information about COVID is received, about threats, about Heat islands. Is technology accessible uh, to everyone so that people are well informed? These topics show me that we can have a, a better or worse adap uh, adaptation capacity. And we also need to address coordination processes. By bringing these variables uh, together, climate variables, and actually in Duran, we worked with flooding, uh, heat islands landslides and we also work with COVID-19 and we analyzed what happened uh, with individuals at a city level, community level, institutional level, special institutions that work with local management and those that work horizontally, for instance, with risk environment or oh, the health system, the meteorological institute as well that provides weather information. So we included this type of analysis and we noticed that we can go beyond all this. First of all, we have uh, the impact of climate and how it affects health, um, well-being, um, financial means, depression, mental health, etc. Also, if we integrate all this, we can see the risks, which are the chances of a group being more affected than another, which are the major determinants in this case. And what can we do regarding this uh, institutionality and how it can affect risk? Of course, this is very complex as an issue, but we can already work with the different types of debate. Here, what we will see is some examples regarding accessibility and adaptive capacity. And we also have physical, climate, geomorphological variables. In our case, we're very much exposed to in El Nino and its different conditions, we've already talked about this. And in the case of cities, we also need to see if they have the necessary means. What did we find? For instance, uh, data sources, which are uh, you know a bit old, they go back to 2010, but it's, it's still, they give us some information about the different areas in the city where we have more population, where we have people with more disabilities which are the illiterate uh, uh, citizens, where there is a lack of information, for instance, and this makes them more susceptible and vulnerable. Age is very important as well. I have a look at, uh, you know, elderly people. These are some areas close to the river. And, and the people and children um, were live in uh, in the periphery and these populations have cities with lower capacities and their neighborhoods lack the necessary resources. We need to analyze the two different types of age groups. Here I wanted to show you this. Have a look at this area in in red. These are informal settlements. Almost 40% of the city um, is uh, formed by informal settlements. Have a look at this area. 
Well, sorry, Mercy, you have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Here there are areas that, that are informal and formal settlements, so vulnerability is different. And these spots are the health systems. Some of them are located in risk areas as well. Therefore, their infrastructure will be uh, the same. What we did was uh, study the city to, to detect the, the most exposed areas, which their uh, adapt, adaptive capacity was as well. And we need to analyze the impact of climate change and infrastructure, whether population where the populations most affected by diseases are etc and uh, right now maybe if Haley can help me we can uh, show the first poll question thank you so according to what you've heard and in your local context I would say choose three of these items which three items are the most important in the specific um, area where you uh, live? So please choose the three most relevant in your area. Thank you. And in this case, there's no right or wrong answer. The answers will depend on where you live on uh, and on what you consider are the most important vulnerability factors in your area. Haley, can we see the results yet? Um, can you see them on the screen? Uh, Mercy, no, I can't see them yet because um, I can't see the, the full screen. Uh, now I can see them. Thank you. Great. Okay. So it's interesting to see, at least in the poll, that the first, uh, the main priority is uh, basic services, water and sanitation, and after that, access to health services, and that uh, the figure is close to informal settlements. I believe that these are related for sure. And this is what happens in most cities and access to health services is related as well because those areas lack the necessary services because this depends on specific regulations and policies because some services are provided you know sewage services sanitation services and that increases vulnerability okay Two minutes, Mercy. Thank you. We, uh, we have also conducted studies regarding disease distribution. In this case, we can see uh, disaggregated data in the area because, because we actually lack disaggregated data. And in this case, it's, we also need local information regarding what happens in the communities. Also regarding vulnerability, we need to think about the SDGs. How can we have health and well-being? Well, if we pay attention to these SDGs, first of all, facilitating uh, basic services, how can we have sustainable cities? if we pay attention to our ecosystems and try to use them because this will make us more resilient we should also try and help these ecosystems recover because they provide us with balance and help us be more resilient finally just a few ideas um, regarding urban health and how we should consider sensitivity and susceptibility also regarding epidemics vector-borne diseases mental health and long-term impacts and also chronic diseases we, we lack programs of this kind adaptive adaptive capacity is also essential 
We need to have interinstitutional articulation. We need to strengthen epidemiological surveillance and SAT. And we also need to share data so we can develop early warning systems for the future. We also need to improve uh, society's capacity. We need to teach people so that they are also resilient when it comes to responding and recovering with through preparation, prevention and recovery processes. Thank you very much. And this is part of the team that's been working for more than four years in these vulnerability and resilience processes. And we're about to implement uh, floodings early system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mercy. The presentation has been excellent. I think you have provided uh, great examples uh, that illustrate what Chris has said. So now we would like to welcome Anai so that she can tell us about their process in Neuquén, the province of Argentina. Welcome, Anai. Thank you. Welcome everyone to this talk as well. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So first of all, I would like to tell you about the context, uh, background information about this uh, project. This is a, a, a project funded by the GEF. Three provinces are selected in Argentina, three subnational jurisdictions um, to address for the first time uh, climate change and health uh, sector specific plans. I participated as a consultant by supporting this process. I would like to tell you that, that this is uh, supported by other um, parallel um, events. These were nationwide actions such as the, the climate change law um, adoption in 2019. Also, one of the objectives of this law are the provincial response plans. This experience, the uh, clim uh, provincial climate change and health plan, we have, you know, a local perspective on climate change and health. And this entails all these articulations that have to do with nation and province uh, at the same time. I would like to tell you how we worked on the provincial plan and on this perspective that both Chris and Mercy have mentioned regarding uh, climate risk definition, which are a priority, uh, the ones that are a priority in Neuquén. Here we have some risk maps developed specifically for this purpose from information that is systematically included in the CMARC plat platform in Argentina. This is the climate, ri climate change risk maps system. We work with threats on the one hand, and we also have a social vulnerability index, which I will uh, address in more depth now in order to develop these four maps. These are the priority, the climate uh, priority risks in our province. Then we worked on this social vulnerability index. It was developed by the natural, Res natural resource and environment uh, unit of the University of Buenos Aires. This is the official methodology used by our country when it comes to reporting to the UN system in the area of climate change. And we agree with Mercy and Chris regarding the variables and dimensions considered. In the presentation, uh, sorry, on, in the images, you can see the dimensions that have to do with socio-demographic variables obtained through population uh, surveys and also the results for our provinces. Uh, we have six subdivisions and we can see the, the real situation regarding social vulnerability. In the social context, there's also uh, data um, from the latest 
census. There's a new, there was a new census in 2022. These data could be updated. Um, and Neuquén within the Argentina and Patagonia is not in a, in a terrible situation regarding this vulnerability index. Uh, but we have some heterogeneous situations which must be considered when we talk about the consequence of, uh, consequences of climate change on health. So now I would like to ask you a poll question. Haley, uh, can we activate the question? Thank you. Uh, and it, this is also, I'm, I'm showing you the translation into Spanish as well. So from your experience, I'm hoping that you can tell us in which areas the health sector um, works with the most regarding climate change impact. So let's see if the participants are answering the poll question. Haley, we can't see the poll question. I can, I can see it. Oh, okay, fine, great. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So there we have some figures already. So uh, water, environmental biodiversity, and also cross-sectional or integrated areas. Okay. Okay, as you complete, as you answer this question, please write your questions addressed to the panelists in the Q&A uh, section so that we can read your questions and then we can answer them in the final part of the session. Thank you. Anaí. Okay, um, let's go on. Now I would like to tell you how we worked and with different, with which areas in our province. This was done within, uh, under a project. It's, it's funded by the Green Climate Fund and it is implemented by the, uh, by WHO and PAHO um, with its representatives in Argentina. In 2019, the climate change law was passed in Argentina, and then we conducted a diagnosis, diagnostic assessment to identify the gaps and problems we had. As you can see, uh, a gap that always appears is a lack of coordination among different sectors, not just the ones you have just voted on, but also the, the interaction between local and, na and national governments. Also, ha, um, health, how health professionals do not fully understand the impact of climate change and how it affects uh, people's health and health systems. Also, something to do with mitigation, and these are the GHG emissions. Uh, as uh, caused by the healthcare systems system, and they should also be included in na nationwide policies. As you can see on the map, the three provinces selected for this project as funded by PAHO aim to reflect the different realities in our countries. Remember the vulnerability map I showed you earlier. Um, the aim is, is for these provinces to be able to transfer this knowledge to other provinces so that um, everyone can make programs, progress regarding uh, policy implementation. Now I would like to show you about our methodology. First of all, uh, we work from the health sector and this was done also in other ministries in the other ministries and government areas that appeared in the question I posed. 
these areas and health worked on prioritizing risks with this like traffic light system, high, uh, medium and low priority level, uh, considering how these threats uh, affect the population. So first of all, we had climate threats and activity uh, activities that have to do with health. Then we worked to prioritize the actions that would address those uh, pr prioritized risks, risks or threats. Here you can see that we have the traffic light classification and we determine which actions need to be implemented as a priority or in the short term as well regarding what happens in our province. This involved um, a lot of work both in the health sector and in these other sectors that I noted in the question that have to do especially with the challenge of having to raise awareness among these decision makers uh, to have them realize that climate change has to do with their sector. The production sector, for example, what is the connection to the impacts of climate change on health? Well, for example, um, productive activities that for food production, they have an indirect effect on the health of people if the production of food is affected. And we discussed all of these issues on this work panel, working on these areas that you can see in this slide. We have different sectors of the Ministry of Health. We also have components from the health sector, and the six areas that you saw in that list that have to do with other ministries and other areas of the government. And we also had some open participatory events where we had some awareness um, activities, some workshops. We even worked with the sports ministry. So in a way they had to understand their role and how they could also then take part in, our, in the actions. We also worked with indigenous peoples, environmental organizations, local communities. And as you can see in this chart, after defining and prioritizing the goals, we worked on prioritizing measures. And for each of those, we have these, uh, sheet that had specific actions, who uh, is going to work on those, naming the specific stakeholders and agencies, and also some partners uh, for collaboration, people who aren't necessarily from government, but who can be involved. For example, academia, public universities, research groups, etc. And here I am going to show you just two of the axes and then some of the actions of those. One that has to do with strengthening the response of the healthcare system and communities to extreme climate events. We had temperature variations regarding heat waves, but also some things that have to do with the spreading of some information because our province is in South Patagonia. We are at the southern border of dengue statistically, statistical cases. So these temperature variations could uh, have dengue spreading to new areas. So our health ministry is continuously monitoring this. And so we have measures and indicators aside from actions we need to also state how we are going to measure the progress um sorry and i you have three minutes great thank you in the plan for our province that is going to be published by paho 
soon, we have these indicators that allows, that give us um, some things to measure within a two year frame. Um, and this is a, quite a short time frame compared to what Chris was saying, five years. But the thing is, because we're starting, we gave us a, a short framework so that we can make changes. We can realize if we have missed something and we can change that quite quickly. And so one of the examples of the things that I chose to show you that has to do with strengthening the response of the system to climate sensitive diseases. Here we can see the variability that has to do with zoonotic diseases. Some of the examples discussed also have to do with the, the chance of, of um, some poisonous uh, animals uh, proliferating, um, long droughts. We, we, have already, we have already been having that for 15 years in, in our region. So all of these things that have to do with climate changes and our impacts in our region. Some things have to do with infrastructure and the possibility of including a sustainability perspective in new constructions, in new facilities. So it's green structures, taking into account that into the architecture design, but also sustainability energy in energy use, reduction of urban heat islands, the percentage of green uh, over built surfaces, surface areas. And to conclude, I didn't give you specific materials, but in the presentation, I, I leave you the links to all the documents that have already been published that have to do with the national level in Argentina and the provincial level and the plan that we worked on until the last until last year is going to be published soon that it's it will probably be available in the website of PAHO that would be all if you have questions you can contact me thank you so much for your attention thank you so much Anai for your great presentation I think participants are seeing with each of these examples how the guidelines presented by Chris are applied to each case. And to finish with our presentations for today, let's welcome Matt, who is going to tell us about the work they have done in the city of San Francisco. Welcome, Matt. Hi, thank you so much. Let me just start my uh, slideshow and there, can you see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so my name is Matt Wolf. I am the Climate Health and Program Manager from the city of San Francisco. Uh, we are a, about an 800,000 person city, um, west coast of California. And um, hold on one second, I'm trying to minimize this slide so I can get my notes up because I am a bad memorizer. Um, so one of the th things, the goals of this presentation is really to give a local health department perspective into a lot of this work. Um, kind of a case study of how we used climate projections and health impacts to evaluate our own preparedness to climate hazards. And for the purpose of this presentation, we're also going to focus primarily on extreme heat and wildfire smoke, um, because currently those are two of the threats to health that were being least amount addressed in the city. Um, like I said, San Francisco is about 800,000 people. We're a relatively temperate climate. It is um, rarely gets hot in San Francisco. We're famously cold with our fat fog and our wind. Um, and we're also a city and a county, which is important to mention. So we have a planning department, a public utilities commission, we have, and um, the health department where I sit is the largest department in the city. We run two hospitals. 
And a lot of my work is how to navigate this structure to make sure adaptations are implemented and focused really on human health and equity throughout the department, throughout the city of San Francisco. Um, another thing to announce is that we're one of only two local health departments to receive funding from the CDC to work on climate and health. So the climate and health program really is focused on adapting our department to climate stressors and also representing the Department of Public Health on citywide planning initiatives. So the first thing to mention is that climate change is making extreme heat events and wildfire spents more frequent and more extreme. In San Francisco, an extreme heat event is relatively low. Officially, it's 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, which is consistent with the 95th percentile of days. Um, historically, we've had about three days over 85 a year. By 2050, we're expecting an average of seven days over 85 degrees a year, with particularly hot days getting to 25 days, for particularly hot years getting to 25 days a year. And by the end of the century, we're expecting an average of 15 days over 85 a year, with especially hot years having 51. And this is also true for the days that are particularly warm, over 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which were particularly unheard of in San Francisco. Uh, but now we get a couple times a year, and by the end of the century, we're expecting on really hot years, 10 days over 95 degrees. The map that you see is from the 2017 Labor Day heat wave, where temperatures hit 106 degrees Fahrenheit in San Francisco, which is the highest temperature ever recorded in the city. And then it hit 102 degrees the next day, which was only the second time in history that temperatures hit 102 days in a row. We also have nearly yearly wildfire smoke events where the city is inundated with uh, wildfire smoke for weeks at a time. Um, we're not expecting any wildfires within the city of San Francisco, but from adjacent counties. So these events have significant cascading and compounding impacts on public health. This is um, uh, 911 calls, EMS calls for the entire year of 2017, and you can see that Labor Day heat wave was a huge spike. We saw 48% increases in EMS calls for service compared to previous years, and a 17% increase in emergency department visits. And this data is consistent with um, other uh, health impacts, I mean, other heat events that we've seen. Um, also, this 2017 heat wave, which I'll talk about later, really impacted our hospital system. Uh, we saw huge amounts of patient surge, and our hospitals had to kind of learn on the ground how to triage a lot of the patients that were being uh, brought in for um, dehydration and other causes, as well as many of our hospitals were insufficient to have insufficient cooling. So a lot of our temperature sensitive medical equipment were impacted by the extreme temperatures. So why is San Francisco particularly vulnerable to these health impacts? And once again, uh, we're using the um, exposure sensitivity adaptive capacity model. And one of the reasons is that San Francisco has urban heat islands. The map to the left is a surface temperature map during that 2017 heat wave. And you can see the red parts of the city are where we have uh, industrial uses, we have concrete, we have less street trees, and those happen to be also the same neighborhoods with um, more poverty, more non-white populations, um, greater health impacts and pre-existing health impacts. Um, the other thing to notice is that we have very little cooling. The To the right, you can see the chart. Temperatures inside and outside buildings are very different. We have the least amount of air conditioning out of any city in the United States. And I think one of the biggest things is that we're not used to it in a cultural way. We don't know how to act during extreme heat events. This is new to us. Um, and physiologically, there's some time for thermal regulation. So when it's cold and then it gets hot, it takes us a little while to adapt. Um, what I like to say is that extreme heat events don't happen very often, but when it does happen, San Francisco gets walloped. And part of the reason is because there's some timelines between different uh, events that um, there's not a huge appetite for money for adaptations when this doesn't happen very often. There is a lot of appetite right after a heat event. You'll see a lot of energy, but then that energy tends to trickle away if it's been a year since our last heat event. 
This is our extreme heat vulnerability map. This is very similar to what a lot of other presenters have shown. We took a lot of the indicators of um, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity and layered them to identify neighborhoods of the city with a greater health burden or projected health burden. I would say that this map has been useful and not useful. It's cut both ways. One of the things that I think is different about heat than a lot of other hazards is you can be in any neighborhood and still be impacted if you're an older adult who lives alone, if you're in a home that overheats, if you have pre-existing health impacts. And what we heard from a lot of our political leaders is, you know, my constituents might live in a neighborhood that is shaded yellow, but they're still vulnerable. And how do you use this map to tell the story that you know, just because there's a higher concentration of vulnerable people in one neighborhood doesn't mean that that's the only place that there's vulnerability. And sometimes maps need to tell like a more nuanced story than what you can tell in five different colors. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think is really important and where my mind is at is to design, implement, and evaluate heat addictions, we need to engage a wide spectrum of people to work together. And that includes the people who work on emergency preparedness and response activities, the people who build and regulate and maintain housing, because that's where a lot of our health impacts are, the people who plan and manage open space infrastructure, or other public works, the people who provide health care or community services, and definitely the community, the people who work, engage uh, with the communities most vulnerable to these health impacts. And um, I'm going to be speaking, I'm going to be making very big generalities here that I've seen in San Francisco mm -hmm. that we have two different sections when it comes to this work. We have our planning and infrastructure folks, and we have our emergency response folks. And each of those have pros and cons they bring to this work. So the planning and infrastructure folks have an asset management perspective. So they look at buildings. They're, the planning department is set up to focus on, are these buildings healthy? Or are these buildings standing? And they have really long timelines. They have the ability to um, affect the drivers of health impacts. But some of the downsides is they're looking at these asset, they're looking at assets and not the people that live in the assets. So it was difficult for a lot of them to address extreme heat because their department is set up to focus on whether the building is still standing, not the health of the people in the building. So they're very focused on sea level rise, for example, because sea level rise has uh, infrastructure impacts rather than heat. One of the other things we see is on the other side, emergency response is focused on human health and health equity, but largely on an event specific basis where our hospitals and our Department of Emergency Management respond to a heat wave. But then as soon as that heat wave is over, they're on to the next hazard. And we know that like we need that you this takes year round work and continuous engagement rather than event by event. Another opportunity is that they're very linked up with what the community priorities are. So when the planning department goes to the community and says, we are ex plan we're expecting to do this work. What is your what's important for you? The community often says emergency response. And so it's more aligned on the other side. So one of our goals as a public health department is how do you marry these two worlds? How do you say we want to take the urgency of emergency response and the long timelines of these planning agencies and get people to work together? So over the last few years, my biggest project has been the Heat and Air Quality Resilience Project, and this is a cross-sectoral initiative to get all the public, private, and community stakeholders together to identify, plan, and implement medium to long-term strategies that support those emergency response strategies. So how can we start San Francisco in a place that's further more adapted next year when we have a heat event than we were this year? How can we make sure that we're weatherizing existing buildings where our most vulnerable live? How can we make sure that that we're putting street trees in urban heat islands. And so we have um, a core, so I, I, I'm co-project managing this with our Office of Resiliency. We have a coordination committee, which is really a centralized space that heat lives. For a long time, extreme heat didn't live anywhere in the city. It lived everywhere and nowhere. And we're saying that right now, if there's an issue around extreme heat. This is a body to deal with it. 
We have coordination committee meetings that meet every other month. They're open to every person who wants to come, city, academic, local. Um, and we relative, routinely get about 60 to 70 people from across our sectors. We have four work groups, one on weatherizing existing buildings, one on siting green infrastructure, one on community sports support, and one on emergency response. And we're also running data analysis projects. Um, Hey, Matt, yeah. uh, you have three minutes. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we are happy that we are producing a heat and air quality resilience plan that we're releasing this May. We have four pathways, one on weatherizing existing buildings, one on um, siting green infrastructure, one on emergency response, and one on city government. We're also producing companion materials to for the public on where there's climate projections, what are the health impacts that attach to those climate projections? What are the drivers of those health impacts? And then my role gets harder because I move from this planning space to implementation. So how can I track funding opportunities and connect it to the right city departments? How can I do communications? How can we provide technical assistance, including evaluation, data analysis, and facilitation to these different uh, sectors? Um, and then in my last few slides, I just really wanted to quickly wanted to because this is a health systems project, that after our 2017 heat wave, we did a, a evaluation of our hospitals and health networks, where we interviewed our facility managers, emergency preparedness coordinators, and clinicians at all of San Francisco's hospitals to understand what went wrong, what did they do, and what can we do to prevent this from happening in the future. And we wanted to create something that's like a toolkit that's forward looking that didn't shame anybody, but was like, how can we make sure that we give people the resources so this doesn't happen again. And that includes, um, and so these were the goals increasing capacity understanding impacts and supporting preparedness and response. We found that the main impacts were medical surge. Uh, facility impacts to the physical infrastructure of our hospitals, and then staff uh, were impacted, where a lot of our patient-facing rooms are cooled, but where the hospital administrative staff was not cooled, or that hospital when the sky was orange for the full day because of wildfire smoke, there was a lot of trauma and mental health burden that a lot of the staff held in, in addition to the parent, the patients, and it was important to address that. And so we came up with a toolkit that's on our website, sfclimatehealth.org, that was best practices to prepare patients and staff for extreme heat events, to design and maintain facilities for these events, to plan and for overheated and smoky facilities, to plan for patient surge, and to develop communications. And this includes how to text heat-sensitive patients before heat events to make sure that they have, uh, have awareness, to how to cite your temperature sensitive medical equipment in the most cooled parts of your hospital, all the way down to how to alert your staff that there's cooling stations in your hospital. Anyway, um, the poll that I have is at a very base level. It's just to evaluate the degree of cross sector um, uh, engagement that you've done. How much are you working across sectors? So if you're a planning department, how much are you working with your health department? If you're a hospital, how much are you working with your planning department? Like, have you done this work before? And I'm assuming a lot of you have. Um, maybe I should have done a Likert scale, but or a different type of survey, but I'm just curious about that. Thank you. That's the end of the show. Uh, can you see the poll, Matt? Yeah, it looks okay. like it's about 50-50 here. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. That's very interesting, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Bueno, eh, mil gracias a todos nuestros conferencistas. Creo que... And Thank you to every speaker. I think you have done a great job uh, regarding guidelines and how a vulnerability assessment is made. And also when it comes to identifying uh, adaptation actions and uh, indicators in several areas. We do have some questions. Um, 
by our participants. So I would like to first address a question to Chris. Chris, the question is, Makers to work in a long term program. I'm Please? sorry, all of, all of that was cut off. All I heard was long term program. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's more before that. It's not your fault, the technology. Okay. I will repeat the question then. How to mobilize or persuade politicians or decision makers to work in a long term programs? It's a perpetual problem. There is no one answer to how we do this. We've got a long history in public health of some success in some areas, some failures in some areas. In the long run, the weather is just going to convince the politicians they have to take action. The more heat waves, floods, droughts everybody experiences, the more the politicians understand action has to be taken. And continually to educate them, continue to provide them information about the risks that are being faced, the successes that people are seeing with their adaptation programs is just going to have to be our long-term game plan to make sure that they are on board and continue to take action. Thank you. Gracias, Chris. Eh, hay una pregunta para Mercy. Eh, Thank you, Chris. We have a question addressed to Mercy. Mercy, can you tell us a bit more about how you assessed the uh, individual adaptive capacity, please? Thank you. Yes, we worked. No individual. No, mencionaba que se puede hacer individual, pero es otro tipo de. Globally. So within the community, we evaluated, for instance, regarding governance, we assessed how many groups were working in committees, if there were leaders, if there were organizations, organizations working with disaster risk reduction, if they worked with municipalities as well. Regarding education, we used the information obtained through survey and we used geographical data. We uh, had figures about the population. We developed an index for the five levels. But for individuals, we implemented a more epidemiological approach. But that's not what we do, let's say, we work at the community level and then we work with uh, special statistics, etc., and we work with the stakeholders because this helps us validate what, uh, what's happening. Um, sometimes we would talk to people and they told us, and we told them, this is a vulnerability, these are the vulnerabilities that you have, and they say, they actually proved us wrong. Thank you, Mercy. There's one question addressed to Anaï. Um, can you please tell us a bit about how the misinformation process uh, that affects health professionals and populations about climate change? Did you, did you find this in your study? And is there a way to minimize lack of information regarding climate change and its impact on, and its health impact? Yes, I was telling you about how difficult it is to uh, engage people uh, from from the government. This also applies to popul to the general population. But we also believe this is a great opportunity to show the real consequences of climate change. If we do this from the area of health, 
it's the clearest way for someone to really understand how climate change affects them in their daily lives. Regarding adaptation actions, there is um, awareness raising, for instance. Someone asked about how we should include this topic in uh, medical courses, you know, for, for physicians in training. This should be done from, a, from, from the area of health, and it's actually a great opportunity. And we also worked with decision makers with some examples of tools developed developed by the WHO on the impact of green areas or infrastructures such as the use of alternative transports such as bikes. This, uh, this software allows, uh, tells people how many lives are saved by using these alternatives and they can be monetized as well. We could tell we can tell people how much money the health system is saving um, because some diseases are prevented. And this is a way to communicate these impacts to uh, the general population, to politicians and to health professionals. So we need to keep developing and implementing these um, processes so that they can actually be useful to people. Okay, just two more minutes, one question addressed to Matt, and then we finish the session. Matt. Indicators that will evaluate the implementation of the toolkit that you present? Um, about uh, evaluation? Yes. Um, so for the toolkit for the hospitals, um, I think that there was not a ton of evaluation of the implementation, but we are working with our hospitals right now to develop a co-led hospital and um, Department of Public Health planning process. Um, one of the problems with the toolkit, if I have to go back to that project, is it was led by the Department of Public Health. And I think oftentimes, um, it's easier to evaluate your own actions to have, than to have someone else say, here's 10 things you can do. So what I think if I had to do it again, it would be really giving technical support to a lot of the hospital emergency preparedness coordinators to do that own their own work, as opposed to taking it and doing it myself. For the heat and air quality resilience project, the full adaptation plan, we do have an evaluation um, of that. Uh, we're setting it up now before it's released. We have an epidemiologist that is going to be helping and an evaluator that is going to help um, give technical assistance to all the different departments as they set up their evaluation plans. One of our first actions, I think, is going to be to try to standardize wellness checks for people that are sheltering in place, um, especially in home supportive services. And so trying to create certain benchmarking standards to evaluate effectiveness, as well as just in general, we have some evaluation of the whole plan, including like how much funding we have, how many different stakeholders, is it increasing knowledge of the different participants or their ability to work across sectors. So we, we are trying to evaluate that. Okay, thank you, Matt. Eh, bueno, yo creo que con esto terminamos, eh, well, nuestro... I think this is the end of today's session. Thank you so much to all our speakers. I believe that um, these uh, presentations will be useful in our coming months so that our participants can consider all this in their own um, areas of work. So we'll meet again on Tuesday. We'll be working with health providing uh, centers and we will be talking about how specific risks are analyzed in, uh, uh, from a perspective of health providers. Thank you everyone. See you again on Tuesday. Thank you.